Welcome once again to a Tin Dog Podcast. This is the show that should have been show 300. But as you're aware, show 300 probably happened about a fortnight ago. The reason being is that this show is so long, and I've only got a limited amount of bandwidth, which I kind of have to juggle here and there. Now, I had that enormous chat with Luke from the Minute Doctor Who podcast, which took up quite a bit of the bandwidth, and that only becomes available on the 15th of March, being the day that this goes live. So, by now, you've probably heard show 300 a fortnight ago. But this was the original plan. You see, I wanted to do something that I've never done before, which is interview someone. Now, I know everyone's had those fantastic interviews from Gallifrey, from all the other podcasts to listen to, and that's been brilliant. But I wanted to interview one of my personal Doctor Who heroes. This interview took place about two weeks before Rick Husek died which is why I don't actually talk about it with Matt. I think I should have, but you know what? You can't go back and fix things. This is, and I hasten to add, the first time I've ever conducted a Skype interview with someone. I'm not that familiar with the technology, and I now know exactly what I'd do differently if ever I do it again. So bear with me if the quality goes up and down. I have done my best to try and make this edit work. So here we are, the show that should have been show 300, The interview with my personal hero, the effects wizard himself, Matt Irvin. Right, welcome to the Tin Dog Podcast, uh, Matt Irvine or Irvin? Well, it's actually Scottish, so it's Irvin, but, um, you know, I answer the most... Well, that'll be because you're a special effects guy and uh, um, you do sort of have to answer to how you quite often. Oi, something Um, in the corner there, do something. Oh, that's us, yes. Now, uh, I'll put my cards on the table straight off at this point. When I was looking at um, getting to my 300th show, I thought, right, I'd like to do an interview, which is something I never do on the show. Who do I want to interview? And yes, lots of other people do. The, The stars, the front of house kind of people on the show. But for me... When I was growing up watching the TV show, you were the face of Doctor Who special effects and you were the person that I really wanted to talk to. So my card's on the table, bit of a fan. Well, thank you, Michael, for that. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I... I suppose I have to sort of take a deep gulp and say, yes, I suppose I was the face of effects in general because I did the appearances on, on the Saturday morning kids shows, whereas my colleagues didn't. Um, it was one of those things that came about purely by chance. Uh, I happened to know somebody other who knew somebody else. And once I was on it, in fact, a genu- it's a genuine story. I did the first, um, after I done the first swap shop, uh, and they said, oh, can you come on again? I said, well, have somebody else. And they said, but they know you, and which is precisely, as, as you say yourself, you get known really, of the person that sort of is expected to be on camera. Now, famously, when you were on Swap Shop, you said, if anyone can turn up with a fully working Frankenstein's model, um, I'll hire them on the spot. Now, that's the sort of thing that gets into small kids' heads and uh, makes them go, oh, I know, that's the career choice for me and I'll turn up. Uh, do you ever regret saying something like that? Um, I probably reg- regret saying a lot of things over my life, <laughs> particularly when they've been recorded. But uh, um, it it was actually more to give the idea of um, think outside the box, to use a, a current phrase. I don't think we used that phrase then, you know. Um, well, that was when boxes were very small. Well, and, and, it was the 70s. And boxes were boxes, although if you were a TARDIS, you were a four-dimensional box. But there we are. Let's, let's move on from that. Um it was one of those sort of things that you know, we wanted people with imagination, actually. Um, people used to say, what is the key thing about doing effects, special effects, visual effects, whatever you want to call it? And it was basically being able to 
think laterally. Um, to be perfectly honest, I mean, you could have degrees coming out the top of your head. I mean, but if you couldn't sort of take a smoke gun apart in the middle of a field in the pouring rain and put it back together so it worked, um, I'm sorry, we, we needed people like that. In fact, that's invariably why we put people into top of the pops first time, you know, uh, if they were training as such, because it, I'm not saying it didn't matter if it, if, it, if it went slightly wrong, but, you know, but smoke is smoke is smoke, dry ice is dry ice is dry ice sort of thing. You learn on the job it's the only way to really do it i think it's still the same basically you you mentioned top of the pops now obviously me and lots of other listeners know you for doctor who but you were part of the special effects department which meant you worked all over the bbc so what shows obviously apart from the doctor who and blake seven what other shows did you work on um, yes, it's an interesting point you brought up about the fact that people assume you just work on Doctor Who and they may put in, you know, Blake Seven or... Um, um what, Star Cops? Well, Star Cops, Hitchhikers, all the science fiction ones. They, they sort of know. Um, yes, because the department, when it was first set up in 1954 by the two lovely people of uh, Jack Kine and Bernard Wilkie, both uh, passed away many years now, but uh, they set it up um, to do... Well, it ended up doing everything. I mean, admittedly, they started making miniature models uh, for uh, the set, set department, the scenery design group. Um, they were actually under them before they became a separate department. But then they realised, oh, we can do everything nobody else can do. So that's when it sort of broadened out into the, well, I suppose you could say you, you've got the very three or four basic elements of effects. You, you've got what we call the floor effects. The, why are they called floor effects? Well, you do them while you're standing on the floor. You know, it be a floor of a studio, a <laughs> floor of a, of a field. But, I mean, you know, it's the rain, it's the wind, it's the, it's the snow, it's the explosions, it's the crashing cars, it's all that sort of thing. Then, of course, you have got the models and miniatures which aren't necessarily the same we can go into more of that later if you want um Wouldn't then you've got the uh, special effects props you know it is the doctor who communicator it's the doctor who gun and sort of things but equally it could be oh a comedy somebody sits on a chair and it collapses it collapses safely you know it's a special effects prop people don't realize that and then i suppose you could add on all the prosthetic type of things that the casualties um the the um uh, the bodies, the silent witness bodies and things, which have become a, a really a department in their own right. But so, yes, we did sort of everything of which Doctor Who was important, but it was only a part. If you add up what we did, we probably worked for children's programs um, and light entertainment, you know, The Good Life, Dad's Army, that sort of thing, more than we did for Doctor Who. But people remember Doctor Who. Um, so how did you end up in from what me as a kid was the best job in the world obviously I had rose tinted glasses on and I understand the dangers of most of the chemicals and stuff you were working with now but as a child it was like oh my god you get to make these things for a living but how did you get in uh well you had rose tinted glasses on so did we I think um by chance it's a sort of thing that okay happens serendipity I when I left school, um, I, I was going to be a vet, actually. I was sort of, say, training. I did very, very early stages of sort of a... But then I didn't. And um, I ended up working... Somebody I knew worked for the BBC at Alexandra Palace. I lived in North London. So it was near to us. You know, you could see the transmitter for miles around, or the mast wasn't transmitting at that time. Um, and um, I... I, via them or I wrote to them I'm, we're talking long before email I remember um, mm. anyway I, I got an interview and I think I was expecting to go along to join the film library as a holiday relief that was basically people on holiday used to take their place while they're on holiday um, I didn't join the film library I joined the stills library and okay I have a camera you know do you know anything about photography well I've got a camera okay you're in sort of thing and that got me into the BBC a, lo a way a lot of people did in that particular time they joined in a a fairly low capacity. Now, actual fact, I worked with Brian Hammerhan, God, another one who's died, um, who was my age. Um, he joined in the same way. He joined in the Stills Library. He moved on to uh, news broadcasting, and I, uh, well, I moved to visual effects. But that's basically what I did. I, I was there for about two and a half years, I think, within the news organisation in Stills. Um, and then my boss wrote uh, a note to the head of visual effects, who was Jack Kine, and I went on a two-week attachment, and 21 years later, I left. <laughs> so was it something that actually you had an interest that you'd voiced to other people? Um, I had an interest in that I built models, as most kids did in those days. You know, you build the ethics kits of whatever type. So I had a small portfolio, as the phrase goes, um, in that for news, because I was interested in, in space, and at the time, it was a, the time of Apollo. 
um, and sort of cut along and tortuous stories, most of these are fairly short, that um, the t- at the time, of course, NASA was putting out loads and loads of colour photographs, and we were just moved into colour, BBC One just moved into colour, and uh, everything had to be colour. In fact, bad colour was preferable to good black and white. But, of course, all these pictures were the same, so we were using them, ITN was using them, the newspapers were using them, there wasn't anybody else to use them, but these pictures were fairly common. So I went and made models of the things, and we photographed them, which meant we had different... I mean, it wasn't my job. I was just doing it as an adjunct to it. Um, and then we used them on the news that night. In fact, it, it culminated with Apollo 12, long before your time, I suspect, um, when the astronaut Al Bean pointed the camera, and we're talking very old cameras here, um, yeah. at the sun, burnt the tube out. They hadn't got any pictures. So I photographed, <laughs> I photographed a mix of airfix kits and scratch-built surveyor space probes on a very small base, and I think we used 14 of them that night on the news, going over, we had the voice, but we didn't have any pictures. Well, to be fair, there are conspiracy theorists out there who think that that's what NASA did anyway. Before I did it for NASA. No, well, I mean, yes, I mean, I have to say they do look like models, but I give myself the due. When, it, when they actually got the cameras back from the moon, of course, we're talking of, you know, conventional Kodak here. Yeah, I always thought they were an Aeroflex. Sorry, that's just... No, they weren't. I apologise. I've just, the cameras were, I've just gone off at a tangent. The cameras were Hasselblad, um, two and a quarter Hasselblads, um, uh, but the film was Kodak. <laughs> um, oh, of course, yeah. I mean, and I say that as against digital, remember. Oh, yes. That, 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 is, that is the point. That's where things have changed so considerably now. We've gone from film into digital. And, of course, that applies to m- movies as well as, um, as well as still photographs. But, no, I, yeah. was quite, I was quite pleasantly surprised, actually, when I got the... Because I just set these, these pictures up. The, we knew the Apollo 12 capsule of, of a lunar module landed near to the Surveyor 3 probe, which had been on the moon for about two two plus years or so maybe three mm. um and, and he got it very very close they got about 600 yards or so um uh, but because we didn't know what he looked like i mean you know what was that composition but i set it up and i did all these photographs and we used them on the news and but when we actually got the pictures back <laughs> this is the original codex um yeah i'd got it pretty damn close uh, <laughs> and i know it wasn't a conspiracy you know um it was just pure chance but uh, you know it's quite so anyway this is this is meant I had got a portfolio, admittedly a fairly small portfolio of photographs to take along to Jack and say, here, I can do this sort of thing. OK, you're hired. Have a, have a two week trial. I said it lasted 21, 22 years. Um, so you kind of got the portfolio and you were getting some work um, on the news and other programmes and that. And then you sort of, although you worked there for two year, uh, two two weeks on secondment, um, how did that develop and i mean obviously they took a liking to you because that's i from my experience that seems to be something that's exceptionally important when working in in uh, tv and other things that uh, everyone just gets along um yeah i mean my two weeks you know i didn't stop and go back to news i just carried on i mean it was basically there was a Hmm. two-week attachment oh you can stay i was actually helping out um and uh, it was the only spin-off department the visual effects ever had we never had them in the regions but we, when Open University started, of course, back at Alexandra Palace, I'd moved to Television Centre by then, um, they wanted help setting up building, building models to display mathematical um, equations and things. I mean, most of which we had no idea what we were doing, but I did have a vaguely scientific background. So, you know, I knew, which is why I probably did so many Tomorrow's Worlds and Horizons. They started talking about quarks and things. I knew what they were talking about. And, um, but so I helped out, um, again, very nice guy, unfortunately. He's also died heaven forbid we're all dying off aren't we jerry aberwaff um he was setting that up i did that for 18 months or so and then jack asked me to go down to the main department uh funnily enough the first job i ever worked on was with ian schoons on a doctor who although i always tell the story much to the amusement of who fans is i didn't know what the story was until years afterwards <laughs> and what was it just for the record Sorry, yes apparently it was the curse of peladon um, I didn't know that at the time. I was, oh no, okay, I did watch Doctor Who, but I had no idea. Who was that the one with the, the lovely cliff face and the tiny TARDIS? That's the one, yes. Now, I went down, of course, you know, all right, I joined FX, but of course the, the side doing Open University was a little bit different to, shall we say, the main department, or the only other department. And yeah. Ian was working, I mean, again, if you think of it now, it, it was totally, he was working on a Doctor Who by himself. 
Yeah. But, I mean, you know, sort of doing, I mean, all right, the actual FX input was a lot less than it ever is now, or even if it was, you know, later years in, in, in the 70s, 80s. But um, you think, oh, by himself. Now, Ian was a brilliant designer, um, lovely guy. <laughs> Again, unfortunately, died about three years ago. Um, uh, wonderful designer imaginer of things but he was he totally admitted he was a total useless of technology and, and electronics which i was pretty good at and i actually made the tardis lamp flash in a fairly crude way because the tardis as you rightly say was falling down the cliff filmed fast so the tardis light had to fl- flash very fast and i made it flash very fast so that was my first input into doc two but as i said i had no idea what i was working on at the time it was only afterwards probably talking to who fans oh that was Curtis Pellin. oh thank you very much now i know now what i was working on and you know, from there i stayed and, and went on to everything else so you would probably have just had some sort of battery transistor set up inside um uh, just a little bit of solder off you go well sort of actually funny enough it came from the open university side there was an encapsulated unit called a metronome unit it was designed to give an audible beat um, electronically instead of actually setting a metronome going and we'd use them to actually adapt it so it actually wouldn't just put out an audible beat it would put out a as it were a signal on off on off which of course is what you need for the TARDIS light but you could yeah. being a metronome unit you could speed it up and down which of course is what we wanted we wanted to have it going fast because we're filming at three times speed when you when you do it at normal speed you need it to be three times slower and basically that's what I did later versions use slightly more sophisticated methods but that was the first one Oh, that was your first experience of Doctor Who and uh, well of the 70s which I'm guessing is what we're talking at this point um, was a was a lovely time uh, from an audience point of view for sci-fi as well and as but obviously you've just been saying that the whole department worked across the board across the BBC so what else were you working on oh at that time um I remember doing a lot of um Dave Allen Dave Allen at large <clears throat> the, the comedian um, if, if, you mm, know, yeah. I mean, he's, I haven't, oh, he's been dialogue for many years, but I mean, he's still well known. He certainly has. He's also one of the nicest people you could possibly meet. I mean, unfortunately, you do meet some who are a little bit too big for their boots. You know, I mean, I'm not saying you know you don't get on with them as such, but you know, the Dave was Dave was one of the nicest people you could possibly meet. But he, um, my. Um, my designer at the time was the other, as it were, co-creator of the department, Bernard Wilkie, whereas Jack oh, tended yes. to stay in the office. Bernard was still, a, as it were, a, a jobbing designer, senior designer. And I and, mm. I, and Ian um, used to work with him quite regularly. And one of the programmes he liked to do, I think being senior, he could pick and choose what he wanted, it was Dave Allen. Um, and we did Dave Allen at large, so we, uh, we were out... I um, remember Dave Allen. I mean, it always used to be he was Robin Hood, so there were lots of arrow gags, or he was a vicar. I mean, I remember, I remember once he, um, they buried the um, the inventor of the hovercraft. They, well, they didn't say Sir Christopher Cockerell because he was still alive at the time. But um, so we had a hover coffin, coffin. We had to put two flymos under um, under a, a very very lightweight coffin, and we had to sort of steer it into the church to be buried. I do remember that one. And uh, we collapsed Stonehenge as well. Dave played a very bored visitor to Stonehenge. He leans on one stone. Of course, the whole lot goes over. That that was quite a massive setup to do. <laughs> I think I actually remember that. Yeah, they are ones which are fairly, you know, it's 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 a bit like um, um, uh, Only Fools and Horses when when uh, Dale well, yeah. Boy falls through the through through the hatch. I mean, it's, it's the one everybody remembers, but the Stonehenge one particularly, people remember from Dave Allen. Um, the department itself, uh, when I'm reading the DVD descriptions and things like that, there's always mentions of companies like Shawcraft and uh, later on other ones that were brought in um, as outside contractors. How did that work with the well, department? Well, it worked originally. I mean, in, in the time I was there, it was it was probably less and less because the department at some point was 100 strong. I mean, that included ancillary staff, you know, stores and stock effects and office, but you needed them. Um when it, the department first started with Jack and Bernard, when they when in fact Shawcraft came in, when the Daleks came in, because um, they were still working under design, hence um, the, uh, working as it were to design instead of working as a separate department. Um, so to Ray Cusack, Ray Cusack said, "Hi, hi, hi these two guys, you know, they, they can they can do the design of the Daleks for." Well, in fact, to put it absolutely correctly, Ray of course had done the Dalek design. But yeah. It was the original classic case of the, the base being rounded, not being the slats, which is now well known. And mm. if I remember correctly, the story goes um, that of the two things, Jack looked at making the Daleks to be able to be powered by a tricycle setup, i.e. you could wheel them along, um, yeah. which just didn't happen. 
It's just easier to sit there and push them along with your feet. Um, mm-hmm. when, whereas Bernard looked at this, making this bottom skirt, and oh, it's going to be too complicated. We'll do it flat, and that's we we'll do it out of flat slats, and that's how the flat sides, which is one of the mm-hmm. classic points about Daleks, came about. It was basically it was easier than making the rounded shape. Yeah, yeah. Good old fashioned. Keep it simple. It's less likely to go wrong. Keep it simple, stupid. That was basically it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just wondering because I always thought that some people might turn up uh, things like um, the macra. Obviously, that's before your time um, was wheeled in and people were kind of, oh, so that's the monster we've got to work with this week. But then again, in your time or towards as time was going on, and I'm not blaming you at all whatsoever, because it's well documented that the whole thing with the murka um, was a rush job and was uh, brought on at the last minute and it wasn't actually anything to do with any specific problem it was more of a miscommunications and people saying when things were due and when they were needed um but when an effect turns up that isn't as wonderful as people intended or wanted um how did everyone react um well to put them the the the, the lovely mercury into into context um hmm. It was, and this is well documented on the DVD of exactly. uh, uh, Warriors of the Deep, which in fact, we looked at it. I mean, it's, it's actually on there. We say, I was there with with, uh, with, Day, um, with Pid Davison um, and, and Eric Sawwood, the script editor, and we looked at it. We, when we looked at it, because we all had the same views about it, because it, frankly, it wasn't just the Merc. I mean, the script itself, you know, the storyline, not the script, because the script... Uh, what Eric had done with it um, uh, was was fine, but I mean, it it wasn't the most outstanding of stories anyway, with the best will in the world. And um, but then, let's face it, I mean, you, you know, you you have the good and the bad. To be perfectly honest, modern new who, I mean, there are some stories which aren't, let's say, all that startling, but there are some which are extremely good. You know, you have to take the good and the bad. This one wasn't, but it was the way it was made. We're back in the situation of. We're working in a television studio at the centre, big flat floor, five cameras, uh, three wall a set. Um, I don't think I said it on DVD, but it's like, you know, these studios have the have the seats for the audience for sitcoms there. We could almost put the In fact, somebody did say that to me once. He said, oh, you could have had an audience there. I said, well, we never actually thought of that. But yes, we could have done. It was a bit do like a theatre show. Um, and because you're in the, the, the studio with all the lighting, which is basically hanging from the grid, all the cameras at those times were pretty insensitive, particularly to colour. I mean, they weren't that insensitive, but nothing like modern cameras. They had to have quite a lot of light to them so you get this big flat expanse of light which has got no interest it's all flat there's no shadows and things um and yep. then you bring the creature on and you put it on screen for five minutes and then you wonder why you can see the seams what it needed we if you listen to the dvd what we say on it i, I hope this went through on it is it needs a bloody good edit on it basically to cut it down yes. it's, it's two hours long it's an hour story let everyone cut, yeah. cut down the cut down the script. I'll, I'll go through and cut cut the videos so that it, you know cut the the images. But if you cut it so it moves, it's it's the classic alien. When the movie comes out, how much do they pay for the alien? It's a it's a pretty cheap movie at the time. I think it was six million to make. But the creature took a lot of effort from everybody. But the interesting thing was you didn't see it. You only yeah. thought you saw it. You saw shadows. Now tell me the Merkur is the Merkur would work wonderfully. We've done exactly the same thing. We said this to them. Oh, no, 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 no. We paid a lot of money. We've got to see it. Oh, duh. You know, sort of. Yeah. And in fact, I, when, I did an, an, another, when I did the story um, Stones of Blood, um, which was before it, admittedly, um, I said to them, because they had these, the augury, the creatures. Uh, the big stones. The stones. Yeah. And they originally, I said to them at the production meeting, I said, look, if you want equity members in rubber suits leaping about the moors, count me out. If these are stones, they remain stones. We will make them glow, we will make them float, we will make them move, but they stay stones. I won that one. I didn't win, win some of the others. You know, you win some, lose some. These days, I have to say, the way it's done with, with Russell coming in and reinventing Doctor Who, it works mm-hmm. far, far better. Because yeah. you shoot it like an American production, single cameras, you mean you've got every, you take three times as long, you've got every single shot on, you take loads of times to edit it, but you've got the shots there. And they're not afraid to cut away, to just see uh, shadows, to suggest things. In the old days, oh, stick it on the screen, we'll leave it for five minutes. 
Well, the good news about the Merca is, thanks to your friend Mike Tucker, um, in his latest new book, um, there's a lot of adult Mercas wandering around. And of course, that's a book. So your imagination will fill in the gaps and they look marvellous. I, I spoke to Mike about this. I said, you've done this on purpose. Said, yes. You know, he said, so, so we've, we've come to the, you know, the, we've got herds of Merca wandering across the veldt, you know, sort of in South Africa. It was you know, in the setting sun and things. But no, I think you did it slightly on purpose, that one. Well, I'm not surprised, but it works remarkably well. Um, I can't let you go, and I can't possibly let an interview go past without discussing K9. Uh, obviously, obviously, well, no, obviously, this is the Tin Dog podcast. I'm a quite a big fan of K9, mainly because I was precisely the right age when he turned up on screen. So. I know that some of the original designs for K9 consisted of a guy in a suit wandering around on all fours, and it, he was kind of intended just to be a, a one a one story character. Well, here we go. Here's the urban myth. Let's wreck the urban myth for a start. Um, no, there was never never any attention of a guy wandering around in a suit. That story probably came about. I hadn't actually heard it before. Um, when they did rehearsals, and this is on a time when they re- rehearsed Doctor Who. This is again going back to the old days. Rehearsal Block, which is about the only BBC thing still left uh, at North Acton, the, the whole site there. The Acton Hilton. Yeah, yeah. With the, yeah the, the North Acton Hilton, as we called it. Um, I think some... Actually, having said that, I don't think any is used now uh, as rehearsal rooms. But there was about 10, 11, 12 floors uh, of rehearsal rooms. Big, frankly, just big areas like a gym you laid out um tape on the floor for the walls you there was a there was a little prop store in the basement which was great it, it was a chair um you know oh we've got to the a queen on the throne right the throne is a, you know is, is a bentwood chair because that is a chair it doesn't matter in the studio it will be a throne but there it's a chair something to sit on but what would happen was that john leeson of course he was doing the voice of the dog for every 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 time except one series, um, mm. used to go in. We didn't take the dog, the mechanical dog, round. Um, but John would go in to do the voice, because he did the voice, as it were, live in the studio. Yeah. And he would run around on the floor on all fours, uh, you know, sticking his nose in the cabinets and things. So that's possibly where that came about. Um, we didn't put the actual dog in until we went into studios. Um, <laughs> the story of whether he was going to go, whether he was going to stay, um, yes, that's perfectly true. There were two engines shot of that particular story. One, he stayed, as it were, he stayed on the space station, i.e. he went from Doctor Who. And the other one, when he went with the Doctor. And, of course, as we well know, he went with the Doctor. So the development from... From original sketches to actual working prop, uh, obviously, well, from from a, 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 an almost layman's point of view, I'm thinking um, of rudimentary type of re- remote control car. But obviously, there's going to be at least another four channels involved to do, operate the different aspects of K9's character. Well, yes, here another bit of urban myth to hit the water here because I've, I did not design K9. And initially, I probably didn't have anything directly to do with him, but I was working on the same story. Now, because the story was The Invisible Enemy, it was a very, very heavy effect show. There was no location. The location was basically shooting the miniatures of all the shuttlecraft. And the original designer was Ian Schoons. Now, Ian realized there was, this was getting very, very heavy for just one designer wasn't that long over, remember, and he was just working by himself on Curse of Peladon. And he brought in another designer, um, I think Tony was still an acting designer then, who was Tony Harding. Now, Ian, because he preferred working with the models and miniatures, he did that side, but it left Tony to do the studios. Um, but because it was so heavy, everybody in the department that was frankly free, Ian, give me a hand. Now, I ended up giving a hand to Ian, not to Tony. And I built the, the shuttle models that are fairly um, spread throughout uh, the program. Uh, I did all that lot and helped with the filming on it. But of course, Tony had got the script, frankly, everything that Ian didn't want to do, which was studios. And here we have um, computers shaped like a dog. And although people like to think, yes, Tony must have sat down and done some wonderful designs and drawings and sketches and things for to build it from, uh, nope. He's got one fairly basic sketch, which sort of looks like the, the final canine design. But most of the drawings were frankly done afterwards when people, when he thought, I remember Tony saying, he said he felt a bit guilty, he felt he ought, there ought to be drawings, so he did them afterwards <laughs> based on obviously what the dog looked like. So, um, of course, it's accurate, you know, but there is an earlier uh, drawing where, like, canine is on the front, it's not on the side. Uh, the ears yeah. aren't on the top, they're, they're like, um, like little, little colanders, holes in on the side of where ears would be on a dog. Um, so, the, but the overall shape is more or less the same as, as we know and love, 
love mostly love K9. Yes. Um, now the original. In fact, the original operator was Tony himself. Uh, radio control. Now, I always say, people who've heard any of my talks will know I've said this before. We'd had a man on the moon for, for eight years, but we couldn't build radio control. Um, the control was very, very crude. You'd be lucky to get one, two, or three, or four channels. Um, the number of channels they needed was about eight. And yep. the maximum radio control system that existed at the time was six. So they have to use two. They use a six and a four. I've still got them, actually, the Futabas. 27 a.m. to be technical. And anybody who knows radio control will throw out their hands in horror to say, hey, that's very, very prone to interference. Uh, yep. That's why the yeah. would drive into the studio walls and the cameras would go, and, and then you'd get the old buzzing thing across the camera monitors and the cameramen would throw out their hands in horror. Yes, all those stories are basically true about the dog. It wasn't until later when I came in and said, hey, we've got to do something about this. I knew a bit about radio control. That's knowing like one thing more than anybody else in the department. <laughs> um, you know, that makes you the expert. So I, I, uh, over the years, I mean, remember, it's very difficult to remember, oh, exactly, when did we do what? The dog, oh, definitely. The dog survived for three years as, as an assistant. So it was 77 to uh, 81, or three and a half years. Um, and over that time, me, basically me and my, my, one of my assistants, Charlie Lum, um, very, very clever. He's one of our assistants, but he's very, very clever with electronics. Um, we sort of would regularly sort of dive in, pull him apart. Yeah, Charlie, we ought to do something about this. You know, and, you know, I'd go to lunch and find Charlie had done it by the time I got back, you know, sort of like mm. we changed the wheels. We changed the drive from re rear drive, which was the original one was to front drive. So he'd pull himself over cables. We changed the, the wheels to big wheels, so that it, which are still on him, which are about eight, eight inches in diameter. Um, so they pull over sort of um, small cables on the floor. They'll easily drive over carpets and um, grass, short grass and pavements and road surfaces. They won't quite cope with Brighton Beach, but you know, as, as in the Leisure Hive, you know. But then nothing mm. will cope with. Not even feet will cope with Brighton Beach. Nothing copes with Brighton Beach. Precisely. I've been there. It's appalling. It's, it's appalling yes. to walk over, let alone the poor dog to drive over it. So. How they can say it's a beach is beyond me. Well, it's a me. beach full of pebbles, but it's not a beach in the conventional sense of the word. But, <laughs> um, but over the years, and I updated the radio control um, to um, FM, it's against AM, it's much cleaner signal. I boosted the frequencies yep. up, it went up to 40. Um, so that gave us a much cleaner signal to work on. Uh, we eventually, we were still using two radio control boxes, I have to say. So it... Uh, in studio, would it have for the for the two controllers? Would it have two operators, or would they just be very closely packed and you'd be sort of multitasking? You know, you're only control. You don't do because you can have signals no. beating against one another. Hence the reason that I wondered if there was two operators. But uh, normally, okay. occasionally, I suspect somebody may have um, uh, taken one of them and, and operated the tail or the ears or something. But no, it was normally just a case of we had we had a little box you put the two controllers in and basically hope they didn't remember working very very close these 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 are aircraft model aircraft controllers they work a mile yeah. away and we were working you know three three meters away so in that way yeah. we had we had the advantage of having a fairly strong signal going out to him and these days actually i recently for recent series i moved him on to 2.4 gigahertz which is bluetooth uh, frequencies um, and now i use one transmitter um, it'll run 30 objects. You could run 30 dogs, not at the same time, but I could program 30 different into it. It's a computer. This happens to be a radio control system. It's completely different now. And it's locked in worldwide. You know, that frequency and that, that transmitter, that receiver, they work together. Boom, that's it. <laughs> so I don't oh, have to worry about I've just had a terrible feeling that you could run K9 these days on an iPad. And I'm just going to weep at the thought of that. But yes, let's leave it there. <laughs> So his framework, um, is the K9 that's operated now the same K9? Or is it a bit like sort of Trigger's brush? He's had ultimate, so many heads have been replaced and so many bodies. Um, yeah. No, he, he's less like Trigger's, Trigger's broom or is it um, Lincoln's uh, um, axe, isn't it? Or something, or, um, Abraham Lincoln's axe, isn't it? Or was it the mm. territory? Um, but um, no, I mean, I would say there's a good um, 75% chance that he that, that what he's in in now is the original from back to 1977 um obviously things have changed he went from being the mark one to the mark two uh by repainting him and he went from the mark two to the mark three now if you say did i design any of them yes i designed the mark three 
Mark III was the Sarah Jane Adventures, or correction, sorry, of the Canine and Company, it became Sarah Jane Adventures, mm. back in 1981, when he went from the original colour, which, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I've, I'd forgotten wrongly, I talked to Tony recently about it, I said, well, kind of, wasn't he a goldy colour? He said, no, he was basically a kind of primer I got out of the stores, because we just needed, he was just basically a very dull grey colour. Yeah, he looked like Halford's grey. That's because it was Halford's grey, basically. <laughs> um... Uh, the second one was the metallic black, so it became a lot darker. But there was no other real changes to them. We did a lot of changes inside. That's when most mm. of the actual works, the electronics, the radio, and the mechanics were done on the Mark II version. The Mark III, which was done for K9 and Company, because remember Sarah Jane had never seen the dog. She never worked with the dog before. Cause she'd already left. Um, became the colour the way I designed him, which is it, okay. He looks. I always do this as like I, I did a schools thing recently, and I said to the kids, "What colour is he?" Because the dog was in front of them. They said, "Oh, he's blue." I said, "No, isn't he brown?" Because <laughs> he's, he's actually brown. He's a dark brown. It's a rover colour, which is appropriate, I suppose. Um, yeah. And I didn't do that on purpose. I just, I just thought of that. <laughs> Oops, I shouldn't admit that. Um, no, don't admit no, it. No, yes, no, you. It was, it was in that. the back of your mind at all yeah. times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a rover brown colour. I think it was called Sierra Brown or something or other. Uh, it was coloured to my original scimitar, my 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 reliant scimitar, which I still have. It's not brown anymore. Um, and then, I, but what I did was to make it slightly unworldy, worldy. I misted, and it was only a mist coat, a Renault metallic blue over the top. So in most lights, he looks the blue, hence people saying, oh, he's blue. But in fact, if you look at it closely, and particularly look at it in sunlight, you can see the brown coming through. And I, I, I just wanted that out-of-the-worldly look to it. Um, so in that way, and of course all the other design changes that have been done, mm. like he's got more carrying handles on him now than he, than he had originally. He had one, he's now got the three. And they are, they are practical handles. That's it. That is the way we pick him up, basically. Uh, yeah. Are they the ones you can get from Ikea? No, the ones you get from Radio Spares, RS. Ah, right. <laughs> you can still get them. I still get the email. Where do you get those from? The lights on the top. The lamps on the top are RS component um, indicator lamps, and they're the same things that Peter Cushing wears in Star Wars, first and original movie, um, as his badges on his uniform, Imperial Troops uniform. They're the same thing. You see... You don't want to get this level of information anywhere else. Isn't that a Mark. useless bit of information for you? Because to be honest, there'll be listeners going, "Oh my God, that's fantastic!" I'm off. Yeah, yeah. Right. So is his body primarily fiberglass? It's fiberglass. Tony dis- originally designed the shape. Uh, they made a, f- a wooden original. They took a fiberglass shell and then they took off. Um, and in fact, the number. In fact, going back to Mike, Mike and myself have often gone mm. through of um, how many did we turn off. It was five or six originally, and I, that number came about because we always had the dummy canine. Um, yeah. Because if you see somebody pick him up in shot, they're not picking up the original. You have a job picking up the original. It is quite Yeah, heavy. well, he's always got a, a blank base as well on the bottom. Yeah, you can, you can actually see that. I've got some several stills where you can see very obviously there's nothing there <laughs> inside it. But that's yeah. whenever, well, it was only Tom who worked with him. Tom Baker who actually worked with him originally. But turn him upside down or carry him, throw him around, you know. It is the dummy one. The dummy one, of course, has become the rusty one from School Reunion. So the pedigree, and yes, that is a purposeful pun is correct there are only two screen news bbc canines the original working one and the dummy one which became the rusty one which because is also working although not at the moment so we only had the two but we had exhibitions at the time there were three exhibitions going there was the yeah. famous one in blackpool mm-hmm. there was the slightly famous one in uh, longleat long and there was yeah. one people forget about in london so i think at the time there were three bodies turned off from the same mold to make the dummy ones and at Blackpool, towards the end of the Blackpool run, they had two figures. They had the one that they had what was left of the one at Longleat after the fire. They had this pile of melted fiberglass, and above it, they had their their dummy canine in the same case. The one was a bit odd because I mean I remember seeing, looking at that, thinking, why is it here? Because it wasn't a case of oh, canine in the series in the in a, in a television episode has burnt out, and this is therefore he is this is a screen use prop. No, it had burnt out at Longleat. There was an electrical fault. But they left it on display. You're thinking, well, why? Because there's nothing, you know, it's your fault. You know, nothing to do with the program. Mm, um, yeah, yes, a yes, re- yes replace him with, with one that, you know, that is, is back looking like K9 again, because that's how he appeared on screen. 
Why put yep. a pile of ash sheet or fiberglass remnants there? You know, I never understood that at all. But that's the way they <laughs> wanted to do it. Yeah. But uh, so that was the number. I, 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 in the back of my mind, I always think we had a second spare as well. But Mike says we probably didn't. But you know, we're going back a good number of years. The brain we gets a bit off. Right. Two more questions and then I'll let you go. And thank you very much for your time. The first one is, sadly, the effects department's no longer with us. Can you tell me a bit about how that happened? Or did you leave before that? Regarding the effects department, yes. Um, I, I went in 1993. Um, the peak of the effects department probably was in the 80s. And that's when we had the most people there. That's when we were doing the most work. But there was the time. There were two things happened. Um, to be perfectly honest, the, the key was the start of Channel 4. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why? No, I have no idea why. Go on. 82, that was. Well, what happened was, firstly, Channel 4 is a publisher only. It doesn't make any of its own programs. And people then started asking around, well, if Channel 4 could do this... Um, why is the BBC making all its own programmes? You know, already. I mean, BBC always bought programmes. A lot of kids' programmes, particularly the puppet series, they were, you know, they, they were always bought in. They weren't made by the BBC, and of course, it, it bought in American series, Star Trek, and you know, Cagney and Lacey and Dallas, Dallas and, and things like that. Yeah, that was done on BBC. Um, so, you know, but otherwise, it it made everything else itself. Literally, everybody, everybody was a staff member, which was, uh, you know, in, in that way, it was quite nice. I mean. If I go to a party, if somebody invites me to do these days, and you meet somebody or other, oh, you're BBC. Oh, yeah, I was BBC. I was in Birmingham or something. What's your staff number? They're going to know it. Only one person's let yeah. me down. You know, one three nine zero two eight eight. Mine. That's mine. You know, um, you you remember it. Like in the military, you remember your you remember your number. Um, <laughs> it's sort of gone now, as such, because what happened was that Channel Four started. There became this edict of uh, the government, I think it was Maggie Thatcher at the time, you know, that 25% of BBC programmes w- will be made by independents. Now, that means yeah. slightly, yeah. if you logically work it out, well, if we're not making 25%, a quarter of our programmes, we don't need a quarter of our staff stroke effort. So there we have, let's, so we got to the sort of somewhat silly stage, and let's use the design department as an example, because it was the biggest of the design groups. Now, because they had what was called the setting floor. This is where they set up the scenery. They built the scenery before it was dismantled and put into the studios. Now, if you're not making a quarter of your programmes, you don't need a quarter of that setting floor, and arguably you don't need a quarter of your designers. Because you get to the stage where thinking, well, hang on, I can't just get rid of a quarter of the floor. All right, you Okay, you can get rid of the of a quarter of the designers. Then you think, well, I've got a quarter of office space sitting here, empty. So it became the it was the, it was the beginning of the end. In the fact, you think, oh well, well, now do we need any designers at all? Do we need any costume designers? Do we need any makeup? Maybe we just buy them in. You know, maybe we, other programs will be made outside by independent companies. Um, they they will hire their own people to do it, and and uh, they've got a stage when. You think, well, we don't need to make anything. Now, give effects its due, it was the last of the design groups to go. All the rest now, of model gone. makers will always hang on to the end. Well, in that, in that particular way, I went in 93. The department held on for another 10 years to 2003, which ironically, I always say, you know, it started 1954. Do the math, as the Americans say. It made 49 years. It didn't get its gold watch. Um, arguably, Mike was the last to leave. He did in a strange, almost perverse recreation, full circle of what Jack and Bernard did, he set up the model unit, which is because of how Jack and Bernard started. But that only yeah. lasted 18 months, which it didn't mean he could work legitimately as the BBC effects department, sort of, on New Who, which means we could include it in the effects book. Otherwise, we couldn't have done, um, because yeah. the department would have closed before New Who started. But through that, we can include it. Um, but even that only lasted 18 months, and that closed, and so no, no more effects department. So Mike's now completely... Well, my, everyone is now freelance. Everybody went freelance. I went freelance. I started... I, I decided I'd done effects for... Well, I say for too long. You know, you, def- you never forget it, basically how to do effects. Um... I moved in, I did some directing and producing um, and things, and um, I tried to get a movie off the ground, the usual, the usual thing we all try and do, and basically 
you know, kept body and soul together for the for the since not since um, 1993, basically. Um, well, as far as other things to do, I mean, apart from yes, the, uh, the appearances on Swap Shop and Superstore and things like that, and um, a, a few other things. I mean, I had my own own program I co-produced and co-presented uh, called Techno. Uh, yeah, well, yes, and um, and of course, Robot Wars. Robot Wars, I was. Um, co-creator of it with with, um, with, with my colleague um, um, Derek Foxwell um, um, and Steve who was the the producer of it but um, I, I didn't say we felt we ever got the full I mean basically we were doing producer jobs and we never got producer credits on it but I mean you know it, it was quite fun it went as far as it went to be perfectly honest you couldn't do any more but, I, but I've always had fingers in other pies I've always written for modelling magazines um, That's it, and yeah. um, for 25 years, I, I, I wrote for Scale Models International when the magazine existed. Oh, I think it still exists now, but it's a shadow of its former self, in my opinion. Most anyway, things are these well, days. Well, yeah. Um, so I, I've always carried on doing, so, shall we say, the hobby side of model making as well as the professional side, which, which puts me in, a, in, I'd say it's not a completely unique position, but a, but a slightly, using the terminology of unique wrong, but a slightly unique position of being able to look at, you know, a model kit from, as a model kit point of view, an amateur would put together, and then, hey, you we're using this to, um, you know, to make to make uh, um, Doctor Who or Blade Seven. The um, you mentioned it earlier, the book, the visual effects book. Yes. Um, how did that come about? Because it's a monumental tome. It's massively thick. If you if you are going to order it, I would suggest from Amazon because at least the postage is covered by them. Yes, it is. I mean, the the point was um, the effects book. This is B- it's called BBC VFX, i.e., six letters of the alphabet. Um, hmm. It's been an idea in Mike and mine for some time. I mean, we were both the writers of the department um, in that Mike is a novelist. He, he's, he's adapted many um, of the Who and Merlin scripts and things and done a lot of his own, um, his own, um, own ones as well. Um, whereas I tend to write non-fiction. I've done you know, encyclopedia type books or, or I did an earlier book on Doctor Who and I've done some modelling books on, on cars and, and spacecraft, which are my two favourite ones and things. So we were the writers and also the photographers, really. A few other people did take photographs as such. There was one other in the form of Bernard. Bernard Wilkie, of course, wrote the original uh, effects book, uh, special effects, technique of special effects in television, local press. Yes, and which was a, a Bible when I was at college. I mean, and it was for us, actually. I mean, that was it. I mean, you look at it now and I don't say it looks slightly quaint, but you look through it. In actual fact, you think, we're still using some of those techniques. It's not all CGI. I mean, that's a completely different argument. Is it all CGI, computer generated? Oh, imagery? definitely it's, not. No, it isn't at all. Um, no. The, 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 the traditional, I can't even say 3D effects because it's a 3D CGI, but I mean, the 3D traditional effects uh, are still very much to the fore. You, if you were making things these days to put on, say, YouTube and you were at home on limited budgets, it's a fantastic book because it's dealing with things you can possibly get your hands on and things you can possibly pull off yourself if you put a bit of thought into it, if you wanted to do that sort of thing, rather than just go, I will now use this version of Photoshop. No, throw yourself into it. There's, there's nothing like getting your hands on these things in real life and seeing what they can do and pushing them as far as you can. You learn so much more than just emulating what's gone before or using presets on a screen. Well, the thing about it's, effects was, of course, that you never did the same effect twice. Hmm. People just say, oh, do you, you know, did you get a bit boring? I said, well, occasionally. I mean, I, I always quote the cases. Anyway, I can remember, I, after three days, I was sitting making fake logs for, you know, for putting in, in fires so that they would burn. The fire wouldn't burn. Yeah. It, would just look, it would look as if it was like that all all day. And you made these logs by bending chicken wire and covering them with a mash of it wasn't asbestos, but it was the asbestos substitute, which was broken up in water, um, so you could use it like a paste and, and smear it round these logs. And because you got filled, it, oh god, you know, I'm like, no. But it's three days. On the fourth day, you were doing something else. You know, you, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, you could, and there's like nothing using like using asbestos, asbestos that perfectly safe material. Well, that it, it, was, any we, issues we, we didn't know about it at the time. We weren't using that, but it, it was the super lux or whatever the asbestos suit. Uh, as, um, but either was. way, model making is the place oh, to find it, the world's most corrosive and poisonous oh, things. Well, it was actually. We did use a lot of chemicals, and me having no sense of smell. Um, I, I, don't, I did nearly poison oh. myself once. I, Finally, something we have in common. Ah. I used to be an architectural model maker, and I lost my sense of smell there well, as I lost, well. I lost it anyway. I lost it but, um, mechanically, a physiological problem with the nose. But I mean, um, I did have a situation. And I, this again, I haven't told this story for some time, rather. Because I was known for doing um, 
on television, I used to get the letters. We're talking pre-email here, you know, computers. Oh, yes. that, you know, computers, computers did our salaries. That was about it, the size of a small room, correction, the size of a big room. Um, but I said, I got a letter, and I, was, I said, you know, we'd like to bring our group of students around um, to see the department. And this happened fairly often, and Muggins was the one who got to do it fairly, you know, so show them around. So it wasn't until I was addressing the envelope, I realised it was for the Royal Institution, for the um, National Institution for the Blind. I'm thinking to myself... Oh, and, and I think I did phone them up. I said, look, obviously, the, 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 the guys and girls are perfectly welcome to come round, but you realise it's a very visual. He said, oh, they're, they're partially sighted. You know, they, 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 you know, they, they, they're oh, yeah. teaching blind kids. So they're always oh, very well, you know, got no problem. So they, they all arrive and they've got these big thick glasses on. They're, they're peering at stuff very closely. And I, I, I our, our um, sculpture department, which is where, because most of the, quote, noxious materials were, had all the big fans and things into it, was in a, mm. was in a different room. Um, in, in our main department in, in, in Western Avenue, which is where we were for most of the years, um, and I, I strode up the up the ramp because there was a slight ramp that went up to it, uh, up to it, saying, you know, and here we got the, uh, the the sculpture department, and I just walked straight in. These guys and girls, ke- uh, teenagers, um, very poor sight. They came in and they immediately went, oh, four, what's that smell? And I realised, oh heck, I realized, I just I turned on and said, look, you know, I just realised something here. You've detected because your nose works all these <laughs> noxious smells of latexes and things like that going off and, and, and resins and things. Even with the ventilation, it, you still detect them. I said, I, you know, my, my lack of a sense is obviously far less serious than yours, but you know, you, you save yourself from poisoning yourself, whereas I could have just walked into some room and poisoned myself. In fact, I think after I went to go and have a <laughs> test, I said, Doctor, am I poisoning myself? No, you're right, go home. You know, stop worrying about it. It's a shame that the department's no longer there and it's a shame that things move on, but you can't stop apparent progress. And I'll be using the rabbit ears around the word progress. But I am glad that, well, at least part of the department made it all the way through to making the new Doctor Who. Um, Matt Irvine, it's been an absolute pleasure and something I've wanted to do since I was about eight getting to talk to you. So thank you very, very much for your time. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all copyright and property of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Astrology the Book is available directly from Telos Publishing and from Amazon. For personal Astrology readings, visit Hoostrology.com. <laughs>